Okay, so I think, I think we're ready. Um, I'm John Carroll. I'm from the University of Sussex. I'm very pleased to be here to talk to you today about, um, I think, something that, um, we'll, well, I hope there's something in here that will interest everybody. So there's uh, obviously, well, parsing is in the title, and if you're interested in parsing, um, um, I won't be talking a lot about parsing, but I think it will give you an idea of how it can be used in a range of diverse applications that it perhaps hasn't been used in before, or, or I'm not aware of that. Um, if you're interested in machine learning, there's some machine learning, supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Um, so if you're working on techniques or using machine learning, it might give you some sort of insight or some new ideas. Uh, if you're interested in applications, well, we've got real-world applications here. Um, so we're dealing with some sort of quite challenging stuff, um, challenging text uh, that we're, we're trying to process and do, do some useful stuff with. Um, so I hope that would be of interest. And if you've, you've got more of a linguistic background, then there's some examples here and some syntactic analyses, and that, that might also be interesting. Um, I should give a great deal of thanks to my colleagues, Ted Briscoe, Austin Anderson, Paula Buttery, Ben Medlock, Rebecca Watson. Um, we're working together in a company called Ilexia. So if you look at our website, you'll get a better idea of, of what or the full range of things we do and the services we offer and the software we license and so on. So that's a bit of an advertising pitch there. Um, and I'm also going to be talking about some work that I'm doing at Sussex um, to do with uh, medical records processing, and Rob Curling is um, doing that work with me at Sussex. Okay, so here's an outline of the talk. A uh, bit of background about the organisations involved and the, the basic technology that we're using. And then three application case studies. Um, so one's uh, automated assessment of examination scripts. That's foreign language learners of English trying to mark those exam scripts automatically. Um, text message question ans answering, uh, understanding and answering, and mining text in electronic patient records. So that's a medical application. And then I'll conclude. Okay, so a bit of background. Um, the main tools we're using are, of course, a parser. And the one we're using that we've developed over a number of years is called RASP. stands for Robust Accurate Statistical Parsing System. Um, it's domain independent, um, works with a linguistic grammar, and also um, a set of... Um, statistics that, use, that, uh, uh, that we use to disambiguate. Uh, it's fairly e e efficient, and one of the key things for applications is it's embeddable in an XML pipeline. Um, so we have to absolutely integrate with the, the systems that are, uh, are feeding data in and taking data out of our system, uh, and XML is a good way to do that. And we also have a classifier, um, which is... Uh, um, something we've also developed as part of the, the, the company, part of Ilexia, and this is a, 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 a quite a, well, it's a state-of-the-art classifier, but more efficient to train than, than SVMs, but gives pretty similar, um, similarly accurate results. Um, so this is a, a core technology as well. Um, so I've mentioned the company, Ilexia. It's a text mining consultancy, and we also license these bits of software. Um, in support of the applications that we build. Uh, and as I said, go to our website to find out a bit more about that. Um, and I'm also working with, with the last application with uh, epidemiologists at a medical school at, um, where I come from, at Brighton Sussex Medical School, and an organisation called uh, the General Practice Research Database. And they hold a large database of primary care patient notes. Um, so we, we need text, they've got the text, and we're working with them to do interesting stuff with it, which I'll come to later. Okay, so a little bit about the parser. Um, it's um, based on a modular architecture, a pipeline of, uh, of stages, um, but I won't talk much about those. J that just gives you an idea of roughly what's in it. Um, so we, we, we need to do tokenization. We've got part of speech tagging in there um, before parsing, and we've also got lemmatization. And this is a system for English, so I'll only be talking about applications for English, although there isn't anything 
really in here that is inherently uh, language specific. Uh, just the tool we have is is for English. And here's a uh, sort of a, a small example of the sorts of stages that it would go through. So if we got some input, which is uh, then a thought occurred to me, then this is the, a tagged version of that. So part of speech tags and also lemmatization, which is, is fairly trivial in English. Um, we produce parse trees. Um, so here's one. Um, and what I've done is uh, label the nodes with actually the rules that have been used in the grammar. So these are an indication of the linguistic uh, content, um, a better indication than um, just phrase structure labels. Um, and we also produce grammatical relations or, well, dependency structure, basically. Um, so here, it, here we're saying that, um, for instance, we've got a, a subject relation between thought occurring and we've got an indirect uh, object relation between uh, occurred to and the object of that to pre preposition is, is me, uh, which has been lemmatized to I, to the nominative case. So we have these, these various rep representations that we can, we can use in the applications um, or combine together uh, to get uh, the results that we want. Uh, and as an indication of the, the accuracy, we're about in the middle of the pack, I think. So this isn't state-of-the-art accuracy. Um, argu arguably, the, the Clark and Curran system... Um, whoops. Let's see if we can go back. So the C and C system is, is arguably the best robust parsing system um, out there. Um, but the advantage that we have um, is that our system is domain, well, pretty domain independent, whereas the Clark and Curran system is trained up on, on the pen tree bank. And in fact, these accuracies are, are testing on, on the pen tree bank um, text. So we'd expect to do a little bit worse than them, and maybe we do better than them on uh, te text which doesn't come from American newspaper. Uh, and we're about in the middle of the pack um, for uh, throughput as well, for, for speed. Um, so for real-world applications, you can't afford to, to be slow. Uh, sorry, large is good. So this is... Ah, wrong button again. This is um, baseline of the Clark and Curran system, which is probably the fastest, and we're about half the speed of them. Um, the XLE is a, a lot slower, um, for instance. And implementations of Collins Model 3 are, are pretty s are a bit slower as well. Thank you. Okay, so we've got um, decent accuracy, perhaps uh, world-leading accuracy on um, text which isn't newspaper text, and we've got de decent uh, efficiency. Okay, so the first application. This is something that's been done through iLexia, and it's a current contract. Um, so this is a system which has been developed and is actually being used um, by Cambridge Assessment, which is part of the University of Cambridge, um, it's a, I think it's a non-profit make, making company, um, but it does make a lot of money, which it ploughs back in, I think. I think that's the story. Um, so they do uh, testing on, um, uh, for English for speakers of other languages, uh, ESOL. Um, they also develop teaching materials, but we're, we're not involved in that side of the business. Uh, it's a large operation, 2,000 employees and many more examiners than that, and they test millions of candidates um, per year across the world. Uh, and this is uh, computer-based testing. So it's, um, they send out a, a program which contains the examinations, which is downloaded to all the PCs, and the, 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 the candidates run that program um, to, to, to run the test, and then the, the results are sent back to Cambridge for, for marking. Um, they have a, a whole suite of exams, and we're interested in... Um, the one sort of pretty much in the middle, which is the first certificate of English. Um, so for this, there are a number of tests. Um, one of those is a writing test, and we're interested. What we're doing is, is developing and running a system which uh, scores candidates on that writing test. Um, so this is text. Um, things we could do to score it would be to give a pass-fail, 
or we could mark on a numeric scale, or even potentially give, give feedback, so do a qualitative evaluation and mark where the mistakes are. What we're doing is marking on a numeric scale, so we're, we're doing aut automatic marking. Uh, Pass-fail obviously follows from that, um, but giving feedback, um, so marking where the errors are, is, is a lot more difficult, and we're, we're not addressing that. So there's, there's some previous autom aut automatic marking work. Um, this is a, a, a very valuable bit of business. So there, there have been quite a few attempts to automate it in the past, and there are other companies doing similar things. Um, so for instance, uh, one of those is, is Pearson at the moment. Um, they use uh, latent semantic analysis uh, based on um, essays which have been scored um, and learn a, learn a model of, of what a good essay is and what a poor essay is and match that to incoming essays to mark them. Um, one of the issues with, with latent semantic anal analysis, and what we think, we believe, um, it's not, not a particularly good way to do it, is that there are problems with topicality. So if you're using the right words but in completely the wrong order, if, if words soup but you're using the right words, then you'll probably get a good score, whereas you, you shouldn't. You, you should be marked on grammar as well and um, argumentation and so on and, and cohesiveness. Uh, we don't think SVD would, would, would deal with that. Um, and there are other systems as well. Um, okay, I'll just talk about the exam a bit more and then tell you about our technique. So FC, FCE, um, First Certificate in English, it's um, um, sort of a mid-range exam. If you pass FCE, Cambridge ass assessments say your level of, English, level of English is good enough to be a practical use in many types of job. And here's an example of a question. Um, so you recently saw this notice in an English language magazine called Theatre World. Reviews needed. Have you been to the theatre recently? And so on. Write a review of the thing that you've, you've, you've just been to. So this is uh, an essay, fairly freeform essay, uh, just designed to elicit some text from you, which is then marked um, as to how good, e how good English it is. Okay, so we have parsing, we have a classifier, we like machine learning, we think machine learning is a good way to deal with a problem like this. So in general, what you do is to take documents and marks, extract features from those documents, and learn feature weights which correlate with those, those marks, those manually assigned marks. Um, that's the obvious way of going about it, and that's pretty much what we do. But the key part is the feature extraction. So what sort of features do we use? And how do we apply this machine learning? So what actual machine learning setup do we use? Um, well, addressing that first, um, as I said, um, we, we could do pass or fail. Um, what we'd rather do is, is do something a bit more fine-grained. Mark bands, well, we could do that. In fact, what we do is rank preference. So what we do is learn a classifier which says, is this script better than that script? Um, and if we can do that, then we can map to mark bands and give a, a, a mark eventually. So what we want to learn is an ordering over instances, and these instances are exam scripts. And what we do is use our, our classifier, and we train that on randomly sampled pairwise difference vectors. So we take two documents compute a, a, a difference vector, and use that as input to the classifier. What do we do for the features? Well, one feature that we would like to use is um, actually the, the mistakes that the, the learner has made, or the mistakes that, that occur, are, are there in the, in the essay. Um, so if, if we could find all the mistakes, then we'd automatically get a mark, and it would all be very easy. Um, that's difficult to do, but we do have some training data there which we can um, leverage. So we've got um, uh, a corpus, an annotated corpus um, from Cambridge Assessment, where um, 
a load of scripts have been marked according to the mistakes. So here's a sentence um, which is poor English. It's uh, then some though uh, occurred to me. So there's, there's three mistakes here. It should really be, well, what's probably intended was then a thought occurred to me. Um, and we have um, some corrected to A in this annotation, though corrected to thought, and occurred, uh, corrected to occurred, which is the correct spelling. Um, if we had that, um, then we could assign a mark, but it actually it, it turns out that the inverse error rate doesn't correlate particularly well with the mark. It correlates to about 0.5 Pearson's correlation coefficient. Um, but it, it's, it's a useful type of thing that we, we should in try and integrate into, this, into the system. Um, as I said, we can't produce these um, corrections automatically, but what we can do is um, uh, use statistics from a large corpus to estimate that error rate. And then, as I said, the error rate does correlate with the, the final mark. And what we do to get this error rate, this estimated error rate, is to use um, tri well, bigrams and trigrams from the British National Corpus to uh, find common sequences or uh, find uncommon sequences uh, in particular that occur in, in the scripts. So here's an example. Um, the, the phrase in English is bangers and mash rather than mash and bangers. If we see mash and bangers, then that's a, a bad phrase, and we'd score that. Uh, we'd, well, if that was a feature, it would be a negative feature, um, and it would lead to the, 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 the script getting a lower score than otherwise. And it turns out there's a correlation between this corpus estimated error rate and the manually coded error rate, so it's doing the right sort of thing. Um, and we also use features from parsing. Um, so here's an example um, sentence, that same example. Then some, though, occurred to me. And here's a parse that our parser gets for it. Um, since it's not grammatical, it's a very strange-looking parse. Um, we haven't really got a, a proper subject in this sentence, so the parser's tried to make uh, uh, a subject here with... Uh, some though occur, um, occur isn't occurred isn't here isn't it's a passive participle rather than a main verb, and it's got though as an adverb and it's attached that adverb to the participle and managed to somehow to ma manage to make a, a noun phrase out of it, but quite a, a poor one, um, and the, there's a the rule here which wouldn't normally be uh, used in a, in a good parse of sentence and we'd hope that the machine learning system would pick that up as a feature which should be negatively weighted. So that's an example of what parse features would do uh, in this system. Okay, so we've got uh, various types of features here. Um, we've got words, as I said, bigrams from the British National Corpus, part of speech tags, part of speech bigrams and trigrams, um, again from the the British National Corpus, um, parse rule names. So I gave you one example just in the previous slide of things which might be negatively weighted or positively weighted. Um, and the corpus estimated error rate, which is just a number, and that's um, derived from the, the BNC data, British National Corpus data. We ran uh, 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 an evaluation on... Uh, around 3,000 scripts that had been manually marked by four markers. Um, and we did run our system and assess the agreement between our system and the, the markers. And it's pretty high. So this is a, a, a correlation matrix between, um, say, here we got rate of two and their agreement with rate of one. Um, rate of three, their agreement with rate of one and two. And this is our system agreement between our system and the, the, ma the, uh, the humans. So our system doesn't agree with the humans as much as they agree amongst themselves. Um, but this is a pretty tough evaluation because 
our system is trained on quite a, a wide ver variety of data, not just stuff that's been rated by these four markers, um, uh, because we need to get all the data we can. So arguably, the, these, these humans are, are, are actually more likely to, to agree amongst themselves than the system is to agree with them. Um, and we get a pretty high mean correlation, actually, between uh, our system and the markers. Um, so we declared success on this. Um, it's pretty good, I think. And here's an indication of the, the features that are, are ranked highly or um, either in a positive direction or a negative direction. So um, things like using uh, uh, adjectives to make an adjectival phrase are good. Um, fragmentary sentences are bad. So here's an example of a, a bit of uh, gibberish, um, bad English. Uh, it's ungrammatical. So the parser says, I can't find an analysis of this. Well, it can find a fragmentary analysis. Uh, so it can find uh, probably a, a bit of sentence here, Pat knew, but it can't join it onto but or no. So that's a fragmentary thing. So it gets a, a very uh, negative weight. Um, other good things are having a determiner before a noun, um, obviously. Um, here's, here's an interesting one having uh, an adverb after a modal, after a modal verb. And that's quite a sophisticated position for a, an English language learner to, to put a, a, an, ad, an adverb. So that's, that's ranked highly. Uh, prepositional phrases are good and so on. Um, here's, here's a poor one. We've got um, two base form verbs um, following each other. So go, see, that's quite bad. Um, so it's picking up the right sorts of things. Yes, we, we think that's there because um, foreign language learners use because of too much. Um, so there are lots of other ways of saying because of, and this, this one gets overused. It, it just comes out, from the comes out from the machine learner. It says this is, this is a feature that's indicative of a poor essay because there's a lot of because of. So that's the power of machine learning, of course. It <laughs> correlates with the data, and it's also predictive as well. Uh, right. OK, so this system is actually in, in, in use, uh, and it's saving Cambridge assessment a lot of money, um, and it's making our company a fair bit of money um, in return. Um, there are other things we could do with this. Um, so uh, we could use it to do high-precision um, uh, but low recall classif classification of, of errors, perhaps to do allow an annotator to do more annotation or to um, uh, uh, give an indication, maybe in a in more refined version of, of this system, use it as, a, as an actual uh, formative teaching tool rather than just a, a summative one, just one used for marking. Um, so we can classify errors that are due to spelling or miss, missing determiners or uh, subject verb agreement with about nine, well more than 90 percent accuracy. Uh, incorrect prepositions are, are more difficult, about 70 percent accuracy. Um, so there are some things we can do with this system which we're looking at at the moment. Okay, that was the first application. Um, the second one um, involving uh, our company and parsing is um, a contract that we worked on. Um, for an SMS any question answering service. Um, a lot of questions that are sent to these sorts of services are sort of directory inquiry type questions. So someone would text um, to this service, uh, say, VET Market Street in Rugeley. So they want the address and contact details of a VET in, um, uh, in this town, Rugeley. I uh, don't know where that is, somewhere in England. And then the, the, the answer comes back, is, is texted back um, to the person who, who sent the text, um, something like this, and they're charged a, a pound or something for that, for that answer. Here's another example. What's the number for home base in Dumbarton? They get texted back that uh, and get charged a bit of money. Um, 
usually these any question services use uh, a large pool of, of people just sitting there with a web-based interface. The text message comes to them and they type in an answer um, and send it back to, the, to the, the company which is coordinating this and then it's texted back to the, the person who sent it. Um, obviously, this, this, well, th these people get paid a little bit for each answer that they, they produce, but not very much. Uh, it would be bet even better to sort of try and cut them out of the loop and do some of these directory type inquiries, which are in theory quite, quite simple to answer. It would be better if we could do them automatically. So that's the motivation for this system. On the other hand, SMS text is quite challenging for standard NLP techniques. Um, so we saw some examples of poor English with the foreign language learners of English. Um, there's even poorer English in SMSs. Um, so there are quite a few issues here if we want to do anything to do with language processing, I even, well, particularly parsing. Um, you, some of these, these, th this stuff, you think, well, it's, it's just not parsable. Um, but uh, there is enough there we can get hold of, as it turns out. Um, so there's ambiguity, um, uh, text messages, misspellings, mistypings, difficulty in identifying sentence boundaries. People don't usually use uppercase, um, so it's difficult to identify names and so on. So there's all sorts of difficulties there. Uh, but we had a go, and we've done pretty well. So I'll, I'll tell you how we, how we did it. So our, our parser, well, our, our complete processing pipeline is non-deterministic. So we can tag with multiple part of speech labels. So if we can't identify a word precisely, then we can allow the, the tagger to give a, a miscellany of labels and let downstream processing take care of um, disambiguating. Um, we can produce multiple parses. Um, so if there are several alternatives here, some of which the parser is more keen on than others, we can still look at them all and have a go at them all um, and see if we can make sense of one which perhaps isn't the top parse. Um, we're not using machine learning any, in any strong sense here uh, because we haven't got very much training data. So we applied, well, we developed a set of around 50 information extraction type rules um, from sample data and we apply those to, to parses. Um, and if more than one of these rules matches, then we, we take the most specific match and the most informative output. And there is a bit of a classification in here. Uh, just um, We do use a tap classifier, but in quite a, w a weak sense. So here's an example of one of these rules. Looks a horrible sort of thing, but really it's, it's just looking for things which are a, a, a what type question where we've got two prepositions, um, um, so and the, the, the key word that we're looking for is address or name or postcode or number. So it's things like what is the address of, what is the number of, um, what is the postcode of, and then um, an entity, and then in a place or near a place or at a place or whatever. So that's what this, this thing does. So it's a basic what is something where question. Um, so we automatically parse the incoming text message. We get a dependency analysis here. No need to worry about the details. Um, this matches with that. And then we, we extract um, from the, this, this pattern here the things that we're interested in. So it's an address type inquiry. We're looking for a thing of a type gallery. We've got a name for it, Ben Brown, ben Brown Gallery, and the person thinks it's in London. So this is the, the main stuff that we need. And then this is processed further to produce a, a directory inquiry um, query, which is sent off to a number of uh, uh, directories, and then an answer comes back, which is automatically composed. And then sent for manual checking, but then once it's been checked, it's returned to the, the original inquirer. Okay, so how does this do? Well, we did a test on uh, just over 3,000 randomly selected inputs of directory type, inquiry type stuff, and the system gave an output for 43% of those. Um, at first glance, this isn't particularly good, less than 50%, but 
Um, but there are lots of st- there's quite a lot of stuff that we shouldn't be trying to give an, uh, an output for because it's it's really out of scope. Um, so it's asking for things which you, you really wouldn't find in a, in a directory. So there's an example here. Need the number of someone or company who can cat sit, i.e. pop in twice a day to feed cats whilst away in Manchester. Um, you, you couldn't look that up directly in, in, in a directory. And an automated system would have a great deal of difficulty dealing with that. In fact, we don't... We give fragmentary output for that and arguably we shouldn't give any output at all for that because it's something that needs inference and real world knowledge um, here's another sort of tricky one there are two questions in here so with our system as it's set up at the moment we only return one query so um, we can't do this in principle uh, and this is the result that we get uh, if, we, if we try to apl- apply our system to that, that, that inquiry uh, we got a, a mishmash of the, the the two questions put together, which is isn't what we'd we'd want. But if you got uh, where is the British Embassy in London, it's your choice anyway. So uh, <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know. I don't know what the person's intending. So we need some real world inference here. Um, we need um, someone to to, to 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 actually say that back to the user. This. We can't answer your first question, but here's the answer to the second question. Uh, And that's more than a system can do at the moment. Okay, so we we actually did a smaller evaluation of of accuracy um, to to get get an idea of of, of that, well, of the the sort of 57% of the stuff that it is producing uh, an output for, whether it's producing sensible outputs. Um, and we get around 73% accuracy um, overall. Uh, the good thing is that precision is a lot higher than precision than recall. So there's, a, there's only about 7% of stuff that we're answering wrongly um, and actually producing a wrong answer. Um, so that's quite encouraging. Uh, and this, um, oh well, here's, here's a few more examples. Um, that it does get correctly. So where in Cornwall is the Idle, Idle Rocks Hotel? We, we're looking for an address, and it's an Idle Rocks Hotel, and it's in Cornwall. Uh, do you have a number for strippers in Portsmouth? There's quite a few dubious inquiries that come to this, um, this system. Uh, we get that right. How do you switch on voicemail on a Vod- Vodafone mobile? Um, that is a question, but it's out of scope. It's not the sort of thing we can answer. Um, so there are, there are a, a number of things that we can't deal with properly that are sort of directory type questions. So nearest or best, uh, stuff like that is difficult. Um, it's sometimes very difficult to identify sentence boundaries because people don't punctuate properly in SMS messages. Um, there's sometimes faulty extraction of substrings, particularly since there's no capitalization, it's difficult to find named entities. And when there's highly ungrammatical or misspelled input, we don't really have much of a chance. Um, well, this is a successful technology demonstrator. Um, would be nice to extend this system, but of course there are things that, uh, in principle, you, you can't do at all. So here's something that ov- definitely needs a human to answer. Is Monica worth it? If you think you can't live without her, then she's definitely worth it. Good luck. So this is the sort of thing that a system could never deal with. Okay, so that was the second application. The third one is um, a work in progress. Um, So this is work that's going on at Sussex between my group and uh, the Brighton and Sussex Medical School and the GPRD, which holds a large database of medical records, of primary care medical records. So in the UK, we've got quite a nice situation at the primary care level so general practice level uh, in healthcare, that all GPs, all surgeries are computerized, and within those GP practices, all patient records are stored electronically. Um, And most GPs in England use one of two systems, Vision or EMIS. So that's quite nice because we've got a a lot of data compatibility. So if all, all practices that are using Vision all have their data in the same format, um, and similarly for EMIS. So this data can be collected centrally, and in fact, quite a lot of it is. 
um, by GPRD and by a couple of other organizations as well. Uh, so GPRD collect from the, the vision system and they've got data that relates to about 10% of all patients in the UK in their database. A lot of stuff in this database is coded, um, coded for d diseases, um, symptoms and signs, uh, uh, test results um, and uh, uh, um, prescriptions, so drugs that uh, um, patients are taking. But there's a load of free text in there as well, a massive amount of free text. Um, mostly, most work that's been um, done on this, on this uh, data has been on the coded stuff uh, because the, the free text is really quite difficult to process. And there are also sort of massive conf confidentiality issues as well, that the text will contain names of people, names of doctors, names of hospitals and so on. And it could be quite easy, for just given one of these strings, to identify who it relates to. Um, so before anyone can see this stuff, before anyone can actually work on it, it needs to be anonymized. And that's a huge bottleneck. Um, there is quite a lot of data which has been anonymized in the course of previous studies, so we can get hold of that. Um, but uh, to get hold of a load of data to do a particular study that you're interested in, uh, is, is expensive. You have to pay, well, we pay about um, five pence a word, so four, four, four cents, no, six euro cents per word to get anonymized. Um, so if you're after more than, say, 10,000 or 20,000 words, it starts to get expensive. So what we're trying to do is do as much as we can with stuff that's been anonymized already, um, but also for stuff that hasn't been anonymized, we want to run our systems actually within the GPRD on data which is uh, not anonymized, or potentially build a system that can run in general practice surgeries on the computers there to help doctors with early diagnosis or flagging up unusual combinations of symptoms and so on. Okay, so our overall task is to find relevant information that's not normally coded. So if we have codes, then that's quite easy to deal with. Um, a lot of stuff is not actually coded, but it's, it's there in the free text. So whether a particular symptom was observed or not observed, um, whether there was stuff in, 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 the, in the text that we want to pick up on that, that the doctor might not have coded but is potentially relevant, something to do with family history, which normally wouldn't be coded at all, but which we want to pick up on and, and do st in some interesting stuff with. So the tasks we're looking at are early diagnosis of a particular type of cancer, um, ovarian cancer, and finding the true incidence of a condition, which is um, the condition of rheumatoid arthritis, which is quite difficult to diagnose and often isn't coded properly, um, it turns out. Um, but we can find clues about it in, in free text rather than in the codes. Okay, so this is challenging text again. So there's the a famous joke about doctors not being able to write. Um, they can't type either. Um, so there's some examples down here. Um, they use all sorts of abbreviations, uh, ungrammaticalities. There's lots of misspellings because they're under time pressure. They're, they're meant to be looking at the patient and they're trying to type at the same time. Um, so things like orthopod scene. I'm not quite sure what an orth orthopod is. It's something to do with an orthopedic surgeon or a podiatrist and or orthopedists or, or what. Not quite sure what that is. No D. Well, we don't know what D stands for unless we know what the context is. So that's, that's a, an abbreviation which could mean one of several things. Um, it would need to be, well, obviously the doctor themselves or any other doctor in the same practice because the patient could go to any of, any of those within the same practice. Yeah. They, they might have a sub-language, but this also has to be understandable by any subsequent doctor who comes into that practice maybe even 10 years later and wants to be able to look at the history of th this patient. So it, 
Well, the d doctors are sort of trained in note-taking at medical school, so there is a fairly common language and a, a common set of abbre abbreviations. Um, the problem is that it's all massively ambiguous, uh, and, and also they can't type, so they'll type the wrong letter occasionally, and that makes it even worse. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is really take from this noisy signal, uh, take this noisy signal and find as many clues as we can. We're not going to be able to understand it completely. We're not going to be able to normalize it into something which is understandable by any, anyone else, really. Um, and sometimes they, they, they write stuff that they, can't, they themselves can't understand later, so it's a very challenging task. Um, so here's a sort of more extended example to, to show actually that it isn't hopeless. There is some text there that we, we can do some decent language processing in with. Um, so here's something that a doctor would have written themselves, typed at the time that they were examining a patient. So shaky today, feels hot but no sickness, no nausea, no diarrhea, some pain on micturation, abdo pain this morning subsiding now. I can sort of sort of understand that what's going on, and we can parse that. So here's uh, a complete parse of that that phrase. Um, and in fact, it's it's almost completely correct. Um, so even though this is fragmentary, um, so there's no main verb, um, there's sort of a list of noun phrases here. Um, in fact, it's all a list of noun phrases. We've got a, c a complete correct parse, except I think um, this morning should be attached to um, abdo pain, but in fact the parse has attached it to su subsiding. So the, the only question we couldn't ask of, and get right a, a, about this sentence on the basis of this parse is um, when was the abdominal pain? Um, we wouldn't be able to answer it was this morning, but we got everything else right. So that's something that the doctor, the GP types, Here's something, another type of text, and it's uh, an OCR letter from a hospital. Um, and you can see this, is, this has been anonymized because there's some names missing here. Uh, and there's some OCR mistakes. So this should be unwell, but it's been, um, the OCR hasn't managed to get the W there and has got capital NV instead. So we've still got a few challenges here, which we, we'd hope to deal with, um, but this text usually is, 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 is better behaved than, than what the GPs write on the spur of the moment. And we'd hope to be able to get clues from this as well. How am I doing for time? Oh, right, okay. Okay, so what do we do with this? Um, well, this is our plan of work and we've done gone way, some way to doing some of this already. Um, so, as I said, there are lots of abbreviations um, in there, lots of stuff which um, could mean one of several things. And what we wanted to do is to expand descriptions of symptoms and tests and generic information into something which is a little bit more normalised or um, at least we, we, can, we can cope with sort of computationally. So there are things like um, PT and BL. Um, so either we have a list, a large list of abbreviations um, and all the possibilities, or what our, our idea here is, is to compute that list automatically and to work out what PT stands for and what BL stand for. Um, and we believe we can do this using a, a, a distributional thesaurus, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Uh, so inc incidentally, PT is a, a common abbreviation for patient, and BL is a common abbreviation for blood. Um, so, and we'd like to be able to find that automatically. Um, then the next thing we're going to do, and we're doing that now, is to create classifiers from these, these word combinations or expanded word combinations that find symptoms or signs or results of tests or generic information about family history um, and classify those into the coding system or something that's similar to the coding system. Um, so if you see the word um, bloating, for instance, um, that implies, or no, well, even better, diarrhea, that implies something to do with a gastrointestinal symptom. 
And we like to be able to get from that word or a phrase describing that into a code. And then from the codes, well, we, we, we can do sort of standard searches and correlations and so on. Epidemiologists know how to deal with codes um, uh, very well. Um, they, 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 we just can't deal with the text. Um, and if we can get from the text to the codes, that's great. So we want to do some machine learning from the notes that have been annotated with particular codes to learn mappings between uh, word segments and codes. And then eventually you want to identify phrases which relate to symptom severity. We haven't worked on this at all at the moment, but this is, this is more of an information extraction problem. So we want to look for severity of symptoms. Um, we want to look for time periods. We want to look for locations because very often the, these, these things are, are relevant extra information. So, for instance, uh, we've got uh, right hip. Whoops. I'm sorry. Right hip. Um, this means uh, one month, and that means for one year. We'd like to be able to work, work out that automatically. Okay, so the first stage, which we've pretty much done, um, at least experimentally, is computing distribution of thesauruses from um, a large amount of text, from, the, from a large amount of patient record text. Um, and as I said, what we, why we want to do this is to find words which are, are very similar, well, words which mean the same or mean very similar things. Um, so a distribution of thesaurus is computed from looking at contexts of words and clustering together sim similar contexts. So if, if two words occur with in a similar context, then you can assume that they're semantically similar or they're used in the same sort of way. Uh, they might be um, uh, synonyms, they might be antonyms even, but they're, they, they're a similar type of thing. So, so when I similarity, you mean similarity in what? It's similarity in terms of usage. So it might not be actually be sem semantic similarity, but it's it's something to do with the fact that they're used in similar ways, and we're trying to. Li so tumor, uh, well, carcinoma occurs in very similar contexts to tumor. Yeah, so we're we're s we're, we're looking at all of all of the neighbors of tumor here. So we're saying. What words are used in similar contexts as tumour? So carcinoma is the most similar contexts that it's used in. Cancer. Does that mean the third every time? No, no. These these are arbitrary scores. So this just, this is just gives a ranking basically. Um, the, these numbers don't really mean anything probabilistically or in terms of proportions. Um, so the the measures that are, no, are normally used are, are something like. Um, um, cosine difference, or well, cosine measure um, between um, two contexts, or city block measure, or something like that. And the, these, these numbers fall out of that, so then they probabilistically they, they don't mean anything. Uh, but you can use them to give an indication red relativist relativistically of, of similarity. So these words at the top are the most similar ones to tumour, um, but still some stuff down here is quite similar, and cyst and um, abnormality and mass and lesion, um, they're all very good um, semantically um, to tumour, very, very similar. Um, and I mentioned context. We can use two different kinds of context, and people have in the past. So you can look at proximity as a, 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 an indication of context. So are these, these the words either side similar? Or you can use... Um, grammatical information as uh, a key to context. So is this word uh, used as the subject or the object of that other word? Um, so that's grammatical context. And we've tried um, both sorts of context. So we've created two distributional thesauruses on the basis of this text, one proximity-based and one grammatically-based. Um, and here are some examples of what happens with those two thesauruses. So the, the green one is 
uh, the grammatical stuff, the grammatical thesaurus, and the red one is the proximity thesaurus. So looking at this word tumor, um, if we use a grammatical context, we're getting pretty good results here. Um, with proximity, we've got some, some of the same words, but we've got other stuff which isn't so good, like infiltration or differentiated. Um, so differentiated would probably occur right next to the word tumour, but it's a different sort of thing. You'd have a differentiated tumour, but a differentiated isn't the same thing as a tumour. Yeah. Um, in other words, does what, it mean they found in the same context? Yes, it, it's. Or does it mean that yes, they've got. That's context? right. That well, they're they're close. So um, perhaps the well, the word word before differentiated tumor. Um, so if you've got differentiated tumor, the word before that um, would probably occur before tumor as well. So that's a common context, and that's probably why differentiated is there. But that word before might be irrelevant to the, to the meaning. It might not. Um, so that wouldn't be picked up with the, the grammatical version, but it would only be picked up by the proximity version. Just in terms of surface string. Um, so... Um, here's an, another example where we've got uh, the ambiguous word note um, and here the grammatical thesaurus entries are, are better for that as well. These are all things which are similar to note or um, relate strongly to note whereas this proximity stuff is really a fairly random set of words. Um, so we, we're quite pleased with in fact, with the parsing, we, we, to get that proximity, proximity thesaurus, we had to do some parsing. Um, but parsers often fall over with unknown words. So this uh, stands for nothing abnormal detected, NAD. And we don't have that in our lexicon. And we get quite poor results from the, um, the, the, the parser and the, the, the uh, distributional thesaurus from the, the, the grammatical relations, but we get something much better from the proximity as well. Um, warfarin isn't in our parser lexicon, it's, it's a, a drug. Um, so we get some drugs here from the um, um, grammatical relation uh, thesaurus, but we got, get a, a very nice list of drugs from the proximity thesaurus. Okay, so here, here are a few more examples where we, we get some very nice results. Um, so concern, problem and issue are very similar to concern. SEC usually stands for secretary. So doctor, physician and registrar are similar types of thing to that. PT is a patient usually. ABDO always stands for abdomen, so that's good. CREP, I didn't know that. It stands for, I think, crepitation, and that means crackle. Um, edema means swelling, and these things here um, are all sort of tubes that get inserted into various parts of your body, and stent does as well. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm learning lots of new things about um, medicine, and uh, this, is, this, this is almost sort of teaching me um, what, what, uh, what doctors and, uh, do and what patients get done to them. Uh, and we've done some clustering as well, so that, that dis distributional thesaurus gives us neighbours of a particular word, and we can visualise those neighbours collectively by clustering them. So here's an example of a cluster. Uh, diagnosis, support, treatment, management, care, they're all similar things. Examination, finding, assessment, report, they're all similar things. Um, so we, we're getting decent results here, and we're hopeful for the next stage in using these um, uh, thesaur well, distribution of thesaurus data to produce, um, well, to get over the problem of sparse data 
and also help us deal with all these abbreviations or weird and wonderful things that, that doctors write. Um, but I need to put a warning here, more work to be done, that's not a proper evaluation. I've shown you some examples, but I don't have a proper evaluation of how good this, this stuff actually is yet. We're going to have to run some proper evaluations um, as part of a, a larger system. Okay, so just to conclude, I hope I've convinced you that parsing is useful in a range of language processing applications. Um, usually, parsing, well, research in parsing has dealt with well-formed text, almost always newspaper, edited newspaper text. Um, what we're dealing here is very far from that type of text. We've got sort of ill-behaved text, and we're still being able to, able to do useful things with a parser within an application context. Um, so I showed you three applications um, where the role of the parser varies quite dramatically and the type of parsing output varies as well. So we're using variously part of speech tags, uh, parse trees, dependency relations or grammatical relations um, in various combinations. So we've had to think a, bit, a, bit, a little bit creatively how, how we use the parser. Um, and that's sort of related to the techniques we use and the problem we're solving. But these applications are similar in that, uh, I didn't mention this before, but the parsing system has actually received very little domain-specific tuning. So we haven't got large annotated corpora. We haven't got large tree banks of um, things that doctors write or SMS texts. Um, or um, uh, even stuff that, that foreign language learners write. So we're just relying on the domain independence of the parser, the fact that it's got a linguistically written grammar uh, combined with statistical disambiguation. Um, so there's very little domain-specific tuning there, uh, but we've used machine learning um, in there as well to, when we do have a little bit of data, um, so it's not usually parse tree data, it's, it's stuff to do with uh, marking or um, stuff to do with uh, codes that have been assigned to bits of text uh, in a medical record. And we can use some machine learning there to, 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 to um, add to what the parser produces and interface to the application. Um, and I think many other applications can benefit from parsing. So the technology is out there and it works. And I really just want to say we think parsing is really useful, really beneficial for lots of applications. And I hope, I hope I've given you a hint of how it could be used and encourage you to, to think about how it could be used in the applications that you're dealing with. OK, thank you. I think, well, as, as long as the text is reasonably grammatical, um, then our, our system can make a guess at those words, particularly if they're being, they've been capitalised. So if, they, if they're names, then it's pretty good at finding um, uh, and identifying unknown named... Well, there's no named entity recognizer, but it, it is a good unknown word recognizer which would, would pick up on names. Um, the, the problem would come where it's um, uh, jargon or... Um, stuff within, within a particular domain which isn't uh, a name. And I think that would be unlikely to turn up in a, in a foreign language learner essay, particularly at th this level, um, FCE level. Um, so where it's, uh, um, say, a verb which is specific to a, a, a domain which um, we haven't come across before. Um, but even there, we can make a guess if, if we've got um, a, a, a good tagging for the words around it. 
So it shouldn't particularly be a problem. The problem would come where um, the text was ungrammatical in the first place and wasn't capitalized properly. Um, but in that case, that's great because we wouldn't find a very good pass for it and the, the model would pick up on that. So I think we're covered both ways. Hmm. It, it seemed to me 10 years ago that if we can remake density estimation, then we should be able to do a normalization. Yeah, yeah. If we have a name, call it person one, mm. call it mm. person one throughout the text. Yeah. Do you know what in that? I, I've tried to get funding on it several times and never have succeeded. That, that's, that's the standard approach to anonymization, yes. And I think it's, it's the best approach to do it something like a sort of sequence labeling problem. Um, and Sure, you, you can do that, but that, the results may be, 80, if they're 80% accurate, then that's still 20% less accurate than it has to be. Um, because you can't, they, they can't allow any, any mistakes to be made. So, so that's the issue. Um, um, the, the recall has to be exactly, absolutely 100%. Maybe there could be a bit of overgeneration there if you, you're anonymizing things that you don't strictly need to, that's not too bad. But if you're missing only one or two things which are identified with information, then, then all hell breaks loose. Um, so that, that's what they're really afraid of. And that's why it all has to be manual. You might have a, a system, a semi-automated system, where there's a first pass at anonymization. In fact, we're, we're working with GPRD on a contract to do this at the moment. And then, but it would still have to be checked by a human. But I think that, that's the way forward. Um, but it, it's still going to have a human in the loop, and it's still going to cost money. And is the medical application the goal to, um, to extract information and create something like um, text extraction would create, sort of an index card of, so you can build a database of the information? Or what, what's the goal of, it's of the distribution of the thesaurus or the extraction? Um, the ultimate goal is, is less ambiguous. We're just looking for um, symptoms and, and signs which we think are indicative of a, partic a particular disease. So we, we know what we're looking for. Well, we know the disease. We know what is commonly associated with that disease, and we're just looking for it. So it, it's, it's a lot easier than um, unrestricted IE, for instance, or perhaps even e it's easy, easier than classification, perhaps that we're just looking for particular strings, but th those strings are often very difficult to find because the, the language is so awful, basically. Just please, uh, concerning this first application and its not recalculation, um, how large uh, text window do you use to, for calculating the proximity? Uh, I think it's five words in each direction, but I'm not entirely sure. Yes, yes. Uh, well, with this application, we haven't looked at smaller windows. In, in other ones, we have. And th the trouble is, the smaller the window, the, the sparser the data. Um, and once you get low, low counts, then, well, we, we actually have to threshold low counts because they're so unreliable. And once you've done that thresholding with a small window, sometimes you have very little data left. Um, so it's sort of a trade-off between amount of data and, 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 and size of window. Um, in, uh, in other applications, now we're, we're dealing with billions of words of text. We're not never going to get that for medical records. But for billions of words, then proximity with a small window certainly does, does work. And that we're actually doing that um, because we, we don't want to parse billions of words, um, even with a, a parser like this. Um, and once you've got enough data, then, then you don't have, don't have to pass. You can use proximity methods with a smaller window, as you, as you say, and you get quite good results. Just a short question. Uh, all your systems and models were, were used more or less for analysis of uh, the input. Hmm. Is it possible to use them in some way for synthesis, the other way around, and maybe to evaluate the system by generating Mm. And so on, just to see what is in your model. 
It's a good question. No, we, we haven't tried that. Um, I think in theory for the, the, the foreign language essay one, then it, it would be interesting to try and generate some essays and, and, and see what our, our model thinks is a good essay. Um, and it, it could well be that we end up with, some, well, I'm sure we'll end up with something which isn't at all English, which is scored well. And then we might have to look at our features and say, well, that's a feature that shouldn't be there. Or if we have another, another feature like this, this would get rid of that, that issue. That's, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Yes. I don't see how it can occur. In other words, uh, uh, your bad English speakers are not going to run that. I mean, it's, it's either just a spelling mistake. I, th I think I to confuse thought, uh, goal with thought. Uh, I think that's an actual example. I think that is in one of the essays. Um, so they just forgot to write the T at the end. Probably, or they miss miss, or th they've got a confusion between the two words, and they think the two words are the same. I, I don't know. <coughs> there is all sorts of weird stuff in there. Last question. 